Welcome. Thanks for joining today. Appreciate it. Welcome to Katie Community Church. And let's uh, begin, as always, with a word of prayer before we begin our Bible study today. This gives us each the opportunity to make sure that we're in fellowship with God by using what we're going to study today, the rebound technique, which simply means that we are uh, examining ourselves and see if there is anything that we need to confess to the Lord. And that's based on 1 John 1, 9, which says if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's Miguel. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and your forgiveness. We thank you that you've given us this wonderful solution to our sin when we commit sin. So help us to remember to keep short accounts and confess those sins as a when we realize that we have, have uh, committed one. We thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving it for us. We thank you that it's that it's a critic of our thoughts and our intents. And that's as we study it and it's a mirror into our souls. So help us to, uh, to take that uh, information uh, that we see from the doctrine that we've learned and that is in our soul and Utilize that to navigate our way through life and glorify our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. I thought I'd ease up on you guys a little bit after uh, 1 Corinthians. That's a very intense, tough book to, uh, to study and to teach and to learn. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk for the next uh, 10 weeks about the problem-solving devices. I know that you know these, um, but uh, I'll remind you of what my old, one of our professors in college used to used to tell us. Uh, he would say that uh, repetition is theological mucilage, which I found out meant glue. So the more we talk about these, the more they they stick in our minds. So I think it's important that we understand not only these devices. I was talking to my uh, pastor friend up in uh, Denver last last night, uh, and uh, he was asking me what was coming up for our lesson today, and I so I started talking to him about the 10 problem-solving devices, and as it starts out here in our lesson, this is exactly what I was telling him, that the 10 problem-solving devices encompass every aspect of the Christian way of life, if you think about it. If you go through each one of them, you can, as, as we will do, we keep in mind that what we're talking about is, this, is not some random doctrine. It's our life as believers in Jesus Christ and how these impact our life and how we can utilize these to problem solve. And so as we go through there, I'm going to try to explain the best I can how to use these. And that's, that's the application. That's what we want to find out. How do we apply these things? Uh, I think rebound's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, probably the filling of the Holy Spirit and uh, the faith rest technique. Uh, but then after that, we get into the personal sense of destiny, uh, grace orientation, uh, doctrinal orientation, grace orientation, and those things become, you have to think through those a little bit more to dig out the application, but we're, we'll do that, okay? So, as I said, these 10 problem-solving devices encompass our entire Christian life, and that's the victorious life that God has planned for every believer. He wants you and, and, and he wants me to be victorious in our lives. That's what he has planned for us. He doesn't want us to go through life and struggle through life with all the things and influences that go on around us. 
He wants us to be able to handle those in a very positive way and represent Jesus Christ. Christ's life as a human being here on this earth, that he, he had a tough time, just like you and I do, you know. Uh, just think about all the things that he went through and all the um, character assassination, the f- physical abuse. Uh, they, call, they called him a, uh, a heretic. They called him a drunk. They called him uh, a blasphemer. They called him everything that you can think of that was negative about the Son of God. And yet he handled them with grace and with love. And that's what he wants for us to do as well. And we can use these problem-solving devices just the same way Christ used. He, Christ used these problem-solving devices. Now, there's a couple of them he didn't need. Obviously, he didn't need rebound because he was perfect. He didn't sin. So the problem-solving devices are to be used as a system of problem-solving for every Christian, regardless of of their stage of growth. It doesn't matter. We all need to use these problem-solving devices consistently. In other words, no one ever outgrows the need to use all 10 of these problem-solving devices. Now, depending on the problem to be solved, the believer may use one of the problem-solving devices or several of the problem-solving devices simultaneously as the solution to any of life's challenges. So when learned and believed and then applied, and that's the key, the system, this problem-solving system, that's the way I look at it, will stabilize, sustain, empower, and, and liberate a believer so that you can go through life with a relaxed mental attitude, knowing that God has a solution for every problem you face in life. I hope you believe that because uh, it's there. It's for, it's, this is for us. This is for us as human beings. God knows you and he knows me better than we know ourselves. And he knows what we need and he knows that we can solve these problems with some spiritual maturity. And the only way you gain spiritual maturity is by studying God's word, learning God's word, and then applying God's word. If you just study it and don't learn it, it does you no good. If you just study it, learn it, and don't apply it, it doesn't do you any good. So consistent utilization of this system that we're going to study over the next 10 weeks will advance a believer far beyond what they can imagine to a lifestyle of a relaxed mental attitude towards circumstances and everything that's going on around you in life, toward yourself, because, you know, we're the worst critics of our, ourselves as, as us, our self-talk, how we talk to ourselves and how we think about ourselves. We're our own worst critics. Well, with these problem-solving devices, and when you realize who you are uh, as a child of God, as a royal family of God, then that's going to change. Your attitude towards yourself should be changing consistently over a period of time as you're learning God's Word and applying God's Word. Now, if you're just learning it and you're not applying it, then no, you're not going to have a good um, attitude toward yourself. So a relaxed attitude toward circumstances, towards yourself, towards others, of course, and then most importantly, toward God, by realizing that that he is, is a God of love and grace, not vindictive. God's not an ogre. God is your heavenly father. He is your Abba. You remember that word? We've seen it before. Hey, Abba, that, that means daddy. He's your f- heavenly father. He's your heavenly daddy. And he loves you and he wants the best for you. So guess what he did? He gave us a system after salvation to
to take care of the failures in our lives or what the Bible calls sin. So the basis for rebounding, and we know what rebounding, it, the terminology means to bounce back. If you rebound a basketball, you throw it against the, the backboard and it comes back to you. It rebounds, comes back to you. And so rebound is getting back in fellowship with God after you've gotten out of fellowship with God through personal sin. So let's take a look at this. The, it's based, as, as I said in my prayer, uh, on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is so, so God. I mean, this is God. This is how he treats us. He treats us in grace. So all he asks us to, he doesn't ask us to do some form of penance. He doesn't ask us to uh, give up something or, or fast for uh, two weeks or anything. All he asks us to do is come to him and confess our sins. Name it, admit it, cite it. That's what it means, okay? That's, that's what we say right here. So remember that the whole basis for this is the fact that Jesus Christ was judged for all sins, past, present, and future in human history, and therefore sins cannot be judged again. So God was completely satisfied with Christ's substitutionary payment for our sins on the cross. This is doctrine, as we've studied before, the doctrine of propitiation. That theological word means completely satisfied. The blood of Christ, pictured the Old Testament as animal sacrifices, is a technical, theological term for the spiritual death of Christ on the cross when God poured out the sins of the entire human race and judged them. And so Christ's spiritual death is the foundation for all forgiveness, both salvation uh, at salvation when we believed in Christ as our Savior, and afterwards when we utilize the rebound technique, 1 John 1, 9, when we confess our sins to God. So the Word of God is very clear that the result of Adam's original sin which is passed to every human being, is death. But it refers not to physical death, but to spiritual death, which is separation from God for all eternity. Now, what, what led to physical death was spiritual death. So Christ paid the penalty for all sin by dying spiritually on the cross. Then he died physically by dismissing his own human spirit both deaths and the resurrection of Christ are part of our salvation. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, here's what John says. He says, and he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, the complete satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So scripture makes it clear that our sins are paid for, but not only ours, every human being's sins have been paid for. Even those that reject Jesus Christ as their Savior and refuse to believe that he died for them on the cross, their sins are paid for. So the real issue with regard to salvation is uh, faith. Do you believe it or, or do you not believe it? Do you believe he died for you? You have eternal life if you do. If you don't believe that, then you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's the scripture. That's what it says. So the, the basis for all forgiveness is what Christ did for us on the cross. Now, let's talk about the mechanics of how do we do this? Well, I've already mentioned some of that. The Greek word for confess is homologeo. It means, it means to name your sin, but it also means to admit, acknowledge, or cite, like in a courtroom case. So 
because remember that's kind of what we're looking at you know we're, when we talk about uh, our lives before God you know the Bible says come boldly before the throne of God well when you think about it it's kind of like in a courtroom scene you know and you failed and if you go to the judge and you confess your sins you cite it and you say this is what I did in other words call it what God calls it if it's jealousy call it jealousy if it's self-pity call it self-pity cite it just like God cited, and he forgives you and the judge hits the hammer down says you're forgiven so rebound is a word used to describe confession because once again it means to bounce back we rebound after sinning by naming admitting or citing a particular sin directly to God that's why I always tell you keep short accounts when you realize that you made that you've made a mistake, that you've sinned, then confess it immediately. That way, your momentum doesn't get interrupted, right? And if it goes on for a prolonged period of time, then that's when the the uh, divine discipline comes into play, which we'll talk about. But keep short accounts. If you when you realize you've committed a sin, just simply confess it, name it admit it to God, directly to God. All believers in this age are priests, and they, we all represent ourselves before God. We don't have to confess our sins to another human being. We confess our sins directly to God. So another human being, regardless of religious title or affiliation, has no authority to forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. And the Greek word, Confess literally means same name. Jealousy, if it's jealousy, call it jealousy. In other words, call it what God calls it. If it's resentment, call it resentment. If it's judgmental, being judgmental, say, Lord, I was being judgmental toward my fellow man. The second part now of rebound that we don't talk about a lot is to isolate that sin. Put it behind you and then forget it. And don't feel guilty about it. Don't keep bringing it back up because every time you bring it back up, you're re-sinning. If you, I know that's not a word, but you're sinning again because you're bringing it back up and you're feeling guilty about it. And guilt is a sin. So forget about it. You know, that's what God does. And we're going to see that. So this should eliminate any feeling of guilt for past failures. Remember what the Bible says that God cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Here's what Psalm 103, uh, verse 12 says. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, which are sins, from us. The Bible's clear. God forgets about our sins after we confess our sins. That they're done with them. So why should we? You know, Paul, was he, he's the one who said, you know, forgetting the things that are in the past, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we need to learn to do the same. The final part of rebound is to resume your spiritual life. Move on under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because what happens when you uh, confess your sins when you rebound, uh, you restore your fellowship to God. And as a result of that restoration to fellowship, you're once again filled with the Holy Spirit. So the final part of rebound is to resume your spiritual life, move on under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Rebound means to be restored to fellowship with God, which results in being filled with the Holy Spirit. Confess it, isolate it, forget it, and then move on. That's what the scripture teaches. Now, if you don't, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, if you, if you uh, fail to confess those sins, then you get into a situation of carnality, and then God has to step in with divine discipline. So if you confess that sin, 
he's faithful and just to forgive you that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you're back in fellowship. But if you don't confess that sin and you continue to commit sin and you move farther and farther away from God, spiritually speaking, then as a good father, he has no choice but to discipline us. So part of the rebound technique is halting or stopping divine discipline and turning what would potentially be a, a, a curse or cursing into a blessing. We're told continually through the scripture to evaluate ourselves. We are to be constantly checking on our spiritual health. So if you're sitting there and you're wondering, hmm, what, why is this happening to me? You know, what's going on? The first thing to do is not to try to solve the problem yourself through your own human power and ability. The first thing to do is, is sit down, so to speak, and evaluate where you are spiritually. What's going on here? Is this divine discipline or is this suffering for blessing? Suffering for blessing is not caused by sin, but divine discipline is because, once again, God's a good father. He's not going to let us get very far away before he begins to discipline us. So we should constantly be checking our spiritual health. Sometimes God just has to send us suffering um, in order to call attention to our spiritual life. And that does happen. Failure to properly evaluate ourselves and then correct the problem will result in God's discipline. So he's a good father. He's also a patient father and will give us every opportunity to correct our own sinful practices. But when God has to discipline, it normally begins with a gentle tap on the shoulder, right? A, little, a gentle reminder. Hey, you're getting off track here, Stan. You need to get back on track. You know, you haven't confessed your sin. You know, confess that sin. I'll forgive you that sin. I'll forgive you of all the other ones that you've committed up to that point. Perhaps you've forgotten them, but God didn't know it was a sin. Lord, well, you wanted to do it and you did it, so you're responsible for it. The good news is he forgives you that. He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. But failure to heed the warning signs will result in more severe punishment or severe discipline from God. In Hebrews, let me read this one verse to you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 11. Hebrews 12, 12, by the one way is kind of the divine discipline chapter you want to read about it because that's what it's all about but in verse uh, 11 the writer of hebrews who i believe to be paul said all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful of course not you're getting discipline but sorrowful yet to those who have been trained in other words you've learned the lesson by it afterwards, after the divine discipline, after you've confessed your sin and come back into fellowship with God, it yields the peaceable or peaceful fruit of righteousness. So that's why we keep short accounts. We want to make sure that our spiritual momentum doesn't suffer at all. So rebounding as related to divine discipline, is something we need to keep in mind. When we get out of fellowship with God, it's really easy. It's just, just like salvation is easy because it's based on an act of faith. Rebound is based on an act of us going to God and confessing, naming, admitting our sin. Now, there's a purpose for it. God didn't just give us this rebound technique without a purpose in mind, because when you get out of fellowship with God, 
all kinds of bad things can potentially happen to you in your spiritual life, and for that matter, in your life uh, in general. So the first and foremost reason for the rebound technique is to restore our fellowship with God, obviously. First John chapter 1, verse 9 is the verse we use, but the verses around it and before it all talk about being in fellowship with God and being in fellowship with one another as the body of Christ. So it's a fellowship. First John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ continually uh, cleanses us from all sin. So God desires to have fellowship with his children. Now, our relationship with God is not the same as our fellowship. I want you to understand that. Our relationship with God is based on our faith in Christ. That relationship is permanent. That's what we call and have studied as positional sanctification. That's how we stand before God. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ in us. And because of that, we have a permanent relationship with God, which can never change, regardless of what you do, what you do or don't do, what you think or don't think. It doesn't matter. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, you immediately have eternal life and can never lose that because you're kept by the power of God. The Bible says you're kept in his mighty hand. So you can't even get out of God's hand once you're in God's hand. I want you to understand that. So God desires to have fellowship with us. He, we already have a relationship with him, just like your, your earthly uh, father. You have a relationship with him, but you may not always be in fellowship with him, right? Uh, so same way with God. Sin actually separates us from fellowship temporarily until we confess our sins, till we use the rebound technique. The Christian life, of course, includes the study of God's word, and God the Holy Spirit is ultimately the teacher of doctrine found in the Bible. God uses men with the spiritual gift, the pastor teacher, to teach, but ultimately it is the Holy Spirit who is teaching. Therefore, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit when we study the word, and rebound accomplishes that because it puts us back into fellowship with God. And how the Holy Spirit is God. So when you're out of fellowship with God, you're out of fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So what's the second reason? To avoid being condemned with the world system in which we live, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. And we just finished the book of 1 Corinthians, but you may not remember this exact verse. How could you? It says, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world, talking about Satan's world system. So God wants us to be happy. He doesn't want us to be miserable, caught up in Satan's world system, people that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal savior and are not living their lives based on a relationship with him and study and application of his word, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they make it through life without God's help and power, with all that's going on in the world around us. But God wants us to be happy in spite of everything that's going on. He knows that sin in our lives puts us under the control of the sin nature and can only make us miserable. Therefore, God desires that we live as spiritual royalty. You are royal family of God. You have a unique relationship with the God of the universe. So he wants us to live as spiritual royalty. He wants us to be separated from negative effects from this world system in which we live. And you can do that 
if you'll keep short accounts and stay in fellowship with God, a maximum amount of time. The third reason God gave us this wonderful system of recovery is for the production of divine good. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 tells us to walk in the spirit and will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the sin of the flesh. What our flesh, our sin nature, that's a, another word for our sin nature. So through the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, believers can execute the Christian way of life, which results in a life of divine production. Remember the verse that we always talk about regarding salvation? I quote it all the time, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Great verse for you to memorize, by the way, if you want to share the gospel with somebody, because it's so clear. It says, for by grace, that means undeserved mercy, unmerited favor. For by grace are you saved. Saved means talking about salvation, eternal life, being saved, being delivered, literally what the word means. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. Nothing you can do to earn your salvation. It's a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. And we've talked about being and becoming a new creature in Christ. We've studied that many times. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And those good works is the Greek word agathos, and it means good of lasting value. And the only good of lasting value is divine good. So God wants us to produce divine good. That's divine production. But you can't do that when you're out of fellowship with God. Therefore, you need the rebound technique. So this can be either overt or it can be invisible. In other words, witnessing for Christ, for example, under the filling of the Holy Spirit, that is divine production. And that's, that's outward. That's something that somebody can see and they can hear. But also, you can pray for those people as well. That's invisible divine production. So you see, either way, it's divine production because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the key. So that's the purpose of Rebound. Well, let's talk about the sin nature because that's important with regard to Rebound. Because there are actually people out there, believe it or not, that think and believe that after you trust Christ as your personal Savior, and God gives you eternal life as a result, that you also no longer have a sin nature. <laughs> I guess they skip over the verses before and after 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let me read them to you, okay? I know you've heard these before, but I want to read them to you again. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know that verse. Probably everybody's got that memorized by now. But look what verse 8 says. It says, on the other hand. No, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong chapter. I knew that didn't sound right. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, that's singular. That's talking about our sin nature. If we say that we have no sin nature, we are deceiving everyone around us. Now, that's not what, that's not what I'm misreading it. <laughs> we deceive ourselves. And the truth, the truth that we are, do have a sin nature is not in us. If you have a sin nature, believe me, the only one you're deceiving, you say, I don't have a sin nature. The only one you're deceiving is yourself. Everybody else knows that you have a sin nature especially those close to you. And then look at verse 10 after verse nine says, if we say that we have not sinned, and that means habitually sinning, we make God a liar, make him a liar. And his word is not in us. In other words, 
you're calling God a liar. So how anybody can think that is beyond my imagination, but there are people out there that do. So the reason that we need the rebound technique is that we're all born with a sin nature, which is uh, from which comes temptation to sin. Temptation is not a sin. Temptation itself is not, not a sin. We're all tempted. Christ was tempted. But succumbing to the sin, that is what is sin. Not the temptation, but succumbing to sin. It's important that we understand the sin nature if we're going to be successful in controlling it. The sin nature has both an area of weakness and an area of strength. The area of weakness tempts us to commit personal sins, such as the mental attitude sins like, you know, jealousy and hatred and those types of things, sins of the tongue, and then overt sins. The area of strength, however, is a little different. It produces the deeds of human good, which we have studied as wood, hay and straw at the judgment seat of Christ and will be burned up because they're not done under the filling of the Holy Spirit. So these are good things performed by a believer who's being controlled by their sin nature and not by the Holy Spirit. Everybody understand that? So if you understand sin, you understand the necessity to take care of it and to confess it. So the sin nature, as we said, has two trends. One's toward legalism, and the other is toward antinomianism. Let's explain that. Legalism is the futile attempt to earn salvation or spirituality or the approval of God through morality or human works, human good works. This person is a person we would call self-righteous or arrogant, or perhaps self-righteous arrogance is what they're, they're producing. They think that they're better and more spiritual than the next person. We just saw that in the church at Corinth that we just finished studying. They were legalistic. Antinomianism is lascivious lawlessness. I know those are big words. What they mean is unrestrained immorality. In other words, if it feels good, then go ahead and do it. You know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So this person is most often seeking self-gratification to in uh, his rebellion against God, which is also arrogance. Exactly what Lucifer, who became Satan, that's exactly what he did. When he rebelled against God, he became full of himself and full of self-gratification. Look at me. Look how beautiful I am. Look how powerful I am. And he became so arrogant that he rebelled against God and took one third of the angelic host with him. So this is dangerous stuff. This is not to say that we don't all have trends toward both. We do. But most of us tend to to go one way or the other when we're out of fellowship with God. So the sin nature also has a lust pattern. Lust is an illicit desire for, e for either trend uh, of the sin nature, either legalism or antinomianism. So lust causes a person to become a slave to their desires, always wanting, wanting, I want, I want, I want, I want, and never being satisfied with what they have and becoming divorced from reality. And this is, we're talking about lust that's not proper, desires that are not pop, proper. Now, if you have a desire to please God, now that's not wrong, obviously. We're talking about lust for things that are illicit, okay? That's the difference. It's like power lust, sexual lust, monetary lust, revenge lust, wanting to get even, approval, uh, 
specifically of other people and many more. Those are the type of things we're talking about. So controlling the sin nature stifles the lust patterns and allows the believer to live a victorious Christian life. Remember how I always use the illustration with my arms, you know, one of them representing uh, our new nature in Christ and the other our sin nature and how I always tell you the one that you feed the most is the one that becomes the strongest because the other one starves. So you feed that new nature that you have in Christ, right? And it's able to control that sin nature. That's why it's so important to just keep pouring in accurate doctrine into your soul. So you have that strength to do that. So the rebound technique, of course, is uh, the beginning of the solution to these problems in, in our lives. So there is an absolute standard, and we have to understand this in relation to rebound. There's an absolute standard because at e any one given time in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ, you either are 100% spiritual or 100% carnal at any given moment. What Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's either one or the other. So you're either 100% spiritual or you're 100% carnal. Now, when you sin, you become carnal. Hopefully for just a moment or two until you realize you sin and you confess that sin. And now you're 100% spiritual. Remember, spirituality is based on the filling of the Holy Spirit, fellowship with God. Most Christians <laughs> are shocked by the sins of the other of others sometimes they're shocked by their own sins failing to see their own sins overt sins are what most people are shocked by but god is not shocked as a matter of fact in the list of sins in proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 that god hates only two of those sins listed are overt sins the rest of these sins are either mental attitude sins like hatred, you know, that sort of thing, are sins of the tongue. So we need to stay with what the Word of God says and then apply God's solution. And what's God's solution? The rebound technique. So you can see where this is the first problem-solving device. This is where it begins. We've got, we have to make sure that we're in fellowship with God. That's the key. So there are two ministries of the Holy Spirit we need to clarify and understand. The first is the indwelling, and I know you understand this. We've studied it many times. Uh, the first is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Upon faith in Christ as your Savior, every believer is permanently indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. That's the doctrine uh, that uh, is very clear in Scripture, that we are indwelt not only by the Holy Spirit, we're indwelt by God the Father and God the Son. So regardless of whatever your, spirit, uh, your, your spiritual status is at the time, you may be in a state of carnality, you may be in a state of spirituality, the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit is not lost because it depends on the faithfulness not, of God, not the person. So the indwelling is permanent. That's the point, okay? The filling of the Holy Spirit is what is temporary, okay? The filling of the Holy Spirit can be lost when we sin. The filling is obviously dependent on our faithfulness, right? So if we're allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to guide and empower us by using our positive volition, and not saying stop or no to the Holy Spirit by quenching him and by grieving him, then God, the Holy Spirit, will be in control, so to speak. So the filling is obviously dependent on our faithfulness. There are two distinct ministries. They're different. The indwelling and the filling are not the same ministry. 
And when you get those mixed up, you get a lot more doctrine mixed up. Filling means to be empowered and guided by the Holy Spirit and is optional on the part of every believer based on your attitude toward God and his word, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Now, I've given you an illustration of, of the rebound technique uh, that's very, very good, I think. It's in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. It's a perfect illustration of the, of the rebound technique and forgiveness. So in this parable, I know you know it, you've heard it, we've talked about it before we studied it. In this parable, Jesus illustrated the extraordinary forgiveness of God. We have three characters in this parable. The father, an older brother, and a younger brother. You'll remember the story of how the younger brother, the younger son, took his inheritance and departed to a far country. He went to his father, said, Father, I'd like to have my inheritance now. The father gave him his inheritance, and he left to go seek his fortune. He squandered all that he had over a period of time, and he ended up living in a pig trough. And that's where he was eating from, the food that was thrown to them. This son is a perfect example of a believer continually out of fellowship in a state of reversionism, where they've gone past that point of just simple or mere carnality. Not that it's simple, but it's just mere carnality. They've moved farther away from God. But he, in either case, it still illustrates the point. This son is a perfect example of a believer continually out of fellowship through chain sinning. What's chain sinning? Building one sin upon the other. Guilt, fear, uh, approbation lust, power lust, sexual lust, all the lust patterns that take us farther and farther and farther away from God. So the consequences speak for themselves. Once the younger son exhausted his inheritance and realized his terrible state, he looked around and saw where he was at in a pig's pen, he decided to return to his father and what he did is he thought to himself, hmm, I'm in a pig's pen. I'm eating pig's food. That's the state. My father's servants have it better than I have it. So I'm going to return to my father and ask him if I can just be a servant and live as one of his servants. This was his state of mind at this point when he finally realized his terrible state. In Luke chapter 15, verse 19, the prodigal son, his prayer uh, is his prayer of rebound. He said, I will return to my father. He was confused about forgiveness because he didn't understand that his father was going to forgive him. But we know he did. The son convinced himself that his father no longer loved him uh, or even considered him as a son. Isn't that what we do? ourselves sometimes with God you know when we get so far away from God we think oh God could never forgive me for this whatever it is you know for my lifestyle for all the horrible things that I've done in life but guess what a simple act of confession solves all that problem and puts it behind you because God forgets about it Look what, his, what happened here. The son convinced himself his father no longer loved him or even considered him a son. Therefore, he began to think the same thing many Christians do. He thought he had to do some sort of penance to make up for his sin, to pay for his sin. Of course, he was wrong. He didn't have to do any of that. Absolutely not. 
the story ended, you'll remember this, with the father seeing the son coming along from a long way away. And the father began to run to greet his son with loving embraces and kisses. And that's what God does to us and for us when he sees us coming back to him. It's a vivid portrayal of how God forgives us. So no matter what you've done or what you do or might do, God is there for you wanting, begging you, if you, if you will. Not that God begs, but we understand begging us to come back. He wants us to come back to him. God's righteousness and justice ensure forgiveness through Christ's payment for our sins. We've already seen this. So when we name our sins to God, it says, though he is lovingly embracing and kissing us as he welcomes us back into fellowship. And this is truly the grace of God in action. Remember what the father did? He said, bring the robes, bring a ring, put it on. My son has returned. Go kill a fatted calf and let's have a feast. That's what he did. And you'll also remember that his brother was jealous and arrogant and went to his father and said, why are you treating this person, my, my brother, like that? that? He, took, he took his inheritance and went and, and spent it all. And God said, and his father said, you should be rejoicing. You should be rejoicing that your brother has come back to, to us. And that's the way we should feel about people who stray from God and come back. We should be rejoicing with them that they've come back into fellowship with God. And oftentimes we can be that instrument that God uses to help them on that path back. So finally, the rebound technique does not give believers, and I want to emphasize this, a license to sin as some legalistic Christians would suggest. In other words, just because God forgives you does not mean you should go out and commit every sin in the book and live the, in, the way you want to, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die sort of attitude. It doesn't mean that because God's not going to let you get away with it, for one thing. He's a good father, and it's only going to bring self-induced misery into your life. So it's, it's a ridiculous way to think about the rebound technique. The rebound technique is to, uh, to keep us in fellowship with God a maximum amount of time. So though some may be guilty of thinking that, that confessing sin is a license to sin, uh, we'll get disciplined. God disciplines accordingly. God gave us a system of recovery so that we could execute his plan by living our spiritual lives under the control and the power of the Holy Spirit and spend a maximum amount of time in fellowship with him. But that's your choice. That's your choice. God doesn't force you to do that. Rebound has to be the first problem-solving device, as I said, because none of the others can be used unless a believer is in fellowship with God which results in the filling of the Holy Spirit. So problem-solving device number one. I think we've gotten a, we've seen a lot of application there. I hope you have, and I hope uh, you can use that uh, to begin to solve problems or continue to solve problems in your life, whichever the case may be. Do you have any questions or comments before we uh, close in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for the rebound technique. We thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you that you're not a vindictive father, that you're not trying to get even with us or put us through some harsh punishment, but that you want us to simply evaluate our own spiritual lives and keep short accounts so that we can stay in fellowship with you a maximum amount of time. We thank you for this wonderful uh, system that you've given us for restoration. And uh, so help us to be aware of it and to use it 
and to keep short accounts so that we can spend a maximum of time uh, with you and fellowship with you and uh, glorifying you in our personal lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great week, all.